Okay, welcome to the ECGI annual lecture. My name is Mark Becht. I'm the executive director of ECGI. So you are, this is part of um, a three-part event. Uh, ECGI is a membership organization, so we have ordinary members, academic members, research members. Um, and there's always a dinner the night before, so many of you have been to that dinner last night at the British Academy. We then have a business meeting in the morning, which took place before this event. And then we have uh, a very important part of this annual proceeding, which is the annual lecture. Uh, this is a series you can find on the website who's given this lecture uh, before. I'll talk about, well, I will not talk about, but uh, Eric Berkloff, who's a member of the board of the ECGR and a fellow, he will introduce uh, this year's speaker. And let me just already say that we're extremely pleased uh, to have Francesca with us, but Eric will introduce her properly. Now, that's what we'll do now. We then move to the second part of uh, this part of the morning, which is we will be giving out uh, working paper prizes. We have two prizes the ECGI gives out. We have the Standard Life Investments Prize um, for the best paper in the finance series, and we have the Alan Novery Prize for the best paper in the law series. Um, and I hope there will be some suspense now on who has won those prizes but that we shall only reveal after we've heard from Francesca and after the annual lecture. And with this, I turn it over to Eric Bakloff, who will chair this part of the proceedings. Thank you. Okay, and, and, and very, very welcome to, to this um, lecture. And it's a pure delight for me to welcome Francesca Cornelli back to LSE. This is where you had your first academic appointment. But I actually have known Francesca even longer. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't say how long, but, but uh, we met as, at, as, as students in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, like so many Italians going through Bocconi and then ending up in Massachusetts, sometimes MIT's and her case at, at Harvard. She, she um, had very early on an, an interest in, in the real world, but she has worked on many, many things. She's worked on market structure, she has worked on organizational form, financial structure. She has uh, been able to bridge uh, in, a, in a very interesting way the, the real world and, and theory. And I had an opportunity to, to interact with her on many occasions during her, her career. And um, I think there's one particular uh, experience that I, I think sort of symbolizes what Francesca is about as a researcher. So she was brought in to look at the data that the EBRD had collected on its private equity uh, investments. And uh, it was something that, so I worked at EBRD for, for nine years, and, and one thing that I was very keen to, to do was to use the, the data that we had inside the organization. We collect a lot of data you know, for monitoring purposes, but we never really took time to, to sit back and, and think about you know, what does it mean more generally for, for you know, the kind of investments we are making, you know, how we are thinking of ourselves as, as, as investors. And, and, and so, you know, when we brought in Francesca, and she worked with a, a, a colleague of mine at the, at the bank, and then at some point she also brought in another colleague of hers. And um, it was this willingness to really get your hands dirty on these were really very detailed um, uh, accounts on, on, I guess, quarterly accounts even on, on, on the performance of these investments underneath these uh, private equity funds. Enormous, tedious work. And uh, it's that persistence, that uh, tenacity to, to go through that. And then an ability to step back and look at the big picture. And, giving us enormous information about you know, what was happening to these different uh, investment funds and you know, which ones were doing uh, uh, well and which, you know, what explained why some were doing better than others and so on. But then being able to take uh, one step further back and looking at you know, what, what was it about the legal, the institutional environment that, that explained some of these uh, differences. And I think it's that ability to, to go deep into the data, 
look at patterns and then think what is the conceptual explanation for what what, uh, what you observe and she has applied this in, 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 in several other papers a lot of her work has been about the interaction between entrepreneurship and and finance and uh, I think that's still where your your heart is and and, and um, you know, we're gonna talk about our CR CEOs uh, fired for, for bad luck. I think what, what uh, Francesca brings is this, uh, you know, it's not about luck. I think there was some luck in the overseeing research, but it is really a lot of hard work. She has contributed immensely to the profession. She is now the editor of one of the two major uh, field journals in finance, uh, the Review of Financial Studies, and she has been on numerous uh, editorial boards of, of journals, she is part of professional organizations. But she also, and this is what I want to end before I, I uh, leave the floor to Francesca, she very much embodies what ECDI is about, because she is also on a number of very important boards. She, she is trying to bridge this world uh, of academia to the real uh, business world, and she is on Telecom Italia. She is on. She was on Con Confide, the, the Benedetti's uh, holding, and now she's going on Intesa, which is one of the key banks in, in what is emerging out of the, the mess of the, the banking system. But I think it's probably the, the bank that is in the best shape in, in Italy. Uh, you have been on, or you're still on Swiss Re's board, and so you know very important uh, board positions and. One thing I, I tell you, don't be fooled by Francesca's uh, kind, uh, nice uh, outlook. She is very tough. She is in tenacious fighting for minority interests on these boards. And, and uh, so if you underestimate Francesca, you do it at your own peril. So please, <laughs> Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for a very nice introduction. I'm actually glad you mentioned the paper with EBRD because I'm going to use some of the results as, a, again, a, their help. And given that you have mentioned uh, my position on boards, I am not talking about <laughs> my own CEOs or my own experience. This is, uh, uh, they are not in my data set, or at least I hope not. <laughs> So what, what do I mean about are the CEOs fired for bad luck? I mean, CEO turnover is a big, uh, a big issue. We all pay attention to it, especially in corporate governance. In a moment, I'm going to argue whether we should pay att less attention or in a different way. But it's also a fact that the CEO turnover has been increasing uh, dramatically in the last 20 years. So, for example, there was already a study in 2002 by what was then Booz & Company that showed that the CEO succession in the 2,500 largest public companies actually increased by 53% from 95 to 2001. Turnover induced by bad performance increased by 130%. And to give you an idea, that meant the CEO's average tenure was declining from 9.5 to 7.3 years. And surprisingly, or at least surprised to what people think usually the U.S. is the more corporate governance active type of market, Europe had the highest turnover. If you take an even longer period, then Kaplan and Minton uh, have looked at the Fortune 500 firms and find that turnover is 12.6% by 92 to 99, with an average tenure of 7.9, but we moved to from 2000 until 2012, uh, and it moves up to 16.8%, the average tenure of six years. So whatever was already an increase, even a larger increase. So turnover is increasing, the CEOs are, uh, are uh, changing more. What does it mean? Is it the good news? Uh, usually these results are presented, especially the one uh, in 2002, say, well, the world of the, bo the boards are becoming less entrenched, there's more, uh, uh, require, there's more requirement for the CEO, we want them to be more responsible for what they are delivering. That is true, but 
you know, the point that what I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep asking is, well, but will this, is this turnover right, right? That's what we want to ask ourselves. And that also brings to the fact that it's slightly different point, which is also maybe we don't want to look at just turnover, we want to look at sensitivity of turnover to performance. In mm -hmm. other words, do people get fired when they are not delivering, where the numbers are not the numbers that in the budget, let's say. And for example, there's a recent paper by Gentry and Well, and what they do is, let's forget about forced and voluntary. And I have to mention, having worked on these things for a long time, the problem is, you, I'm sure you all know, you can never use whatever is the official reason, because they all retire to pursue personal interest and uh, other things. So clearly, that is not, it, one of the challenge of this literature is always, how do I distinguish a voluntary by first turnover? So like what they said is let's completely forget about whether it's voluntary and forced. Let's see if it's induced by performance. So does it follow bad performance? And what they find is almost 40% of all turnover is performance induced. And that looks like good news, right? 40%, maybe we would like them all, but is it good news? But I am uh, here to be provocative if you want or challenge uh, uh, beliefs, so I'm saying, are we? And in a moment, I'm going to give you a little bit more. The end depends on what, what performance, what is it that we want uh, to look, okay? But in general, for a long time, the corporate governance has interpreted CEO turnover and the sensitivity of CEO turnover as a good sign. It's a board, is monitoring the CEO, is reacting to bad news. But if you see the title, the point is, what are the bad news? Is it bad luck or is it really something about the skill of uh, the CEO? And some good news is people have seen that uh, following a change in a CEO, if it was bad, uh, bad, uh, bad performance, performance uh, got better. But even there, I can be skeptical, right? And I can say, well, if it is just a trend in the economy and I replace uh, in a downtime, well, then uh, I would expect to then revert to the mean. So maybe the improvement after is not, it doesn't really matter. Um, some of the work I've done is to really try to have, uh, to establish causality. So it was exactly the change of the CEO that brought to performance, but they require several uh, steps, methodological, but just looking at performance improvement afterwards, per se, doesn't necessarily give you that result. And then, in recent time, there have been some work that actually have a bit worried us, in the sense that, for example, Genter and Cannon have a paper, and this is well, actually, they look at public companies, and they see that a lot of CEOs are fired following low industry stock returns and low market returns. In other words, the performance is bad, but it's as bad as their peers. So are the CEO really bad or they are just unlucky? They just became the CEO in the wrong time. If they have been good, maybe it was fine. Same couple and Minton, they show the boards do not index their CEO turnover to industry of the markets. So it's not really comparing to the peers. Bad performance, the CEO leaves. So are they punished by bad luck? And you can see that this is an important question, right? If, what does the board have to do? If the board is just reacting to general performance, first of all, of course, that is not what will help the company. But second, do I really need a board of very qualified people if we can't distinguish between the two? So it's a, it's a, it's a heart of a corporate governance, uh, if you want. And I, I have to add, actually, that um, when uh, Marco tweeted, I think, somewhere uh, about uh, the title of the, of the conference, I got another message back saying, uh, you've been quoted in a tweet. In a tweet. So I, I never am quoted in tweets, so I thought I, I have, to go, have to go to see what they say. And it was someone who replied saying, CEOs don't matter. So I don't know if the person tweet is here, but I have to take the things head on. And this is also a very important thing before we go on. Do CEOs matter? 
And it's interesting because also there, the literature has tried to identify fixed effects, right? Is there a CEO effect? And depending on the papers, they say, well, the CEO effect is between 2 and 22 percent. Okay, the rest is macro and uh, effects, uh, you know, general industry movement and so on. Is that low or is that high? I personally think it's very high because, of course, uh, you know, my, the, you can't go against the economy. Of course, if the economy is doing well, the company will do very well. If the company is doing badly, you know, you're just uh, going to row against the stream. But a good CEO is the one that can ride the good economy and can make you ahead of your peers when the times are good and doesn't make the company fall really behind and be the last one in the industry and maybe go bankrupt when the times are difficult. So I do think CEOs matter and that's why change at CEO is such an important, uh, such an important question. Now, is, slightly different question, but as you will see, I will relate it uh, by the end. It's about going back to the sensitivity of uh, CEO turnover to performance. And there is a, a literature, uh, especially looking at U.S. boards most, but it's quite general, that shows that the more outside directors or independent directors you have on the board, and the more, uh, the, lar the, the lar higher is the sensitivity to performance. Okay? And again, that's also seen as positive. Outside directors are known entrenched, and that's why they react more promptly to uh, bad performance and they will change the CEO. Rather than a inside directors, they will just not feel not like reacting. That is true, that's a possibility, but what's the alternative? The alternative is that uh, outside directors, maybe they don't have enough information and they are reacting to the performance because that is uh, all they can observe. And therefore, differently from a director who would be very involved, they may say, well, yes, uh, going back to bad luck. Yeah, the performance is poor, but I was there. The, the, the CEO couldn't have done anything more, right? So again, is it good news that the outside directors uh, increase the sensitivity to performance, or is just uh, uh, an indication that maybe we are reacting too much to the performance rather than trying to collect more information. So in terms of uh, an academic, what we usually say is, are the outsiders really better monitoring, better monitors, they are not entrenched, the, our monitoring hypothesis, or the information hypothesis says they just rely on the imperfect information they have, and that tends to be the performance because it's more uh, what we academic call hard information, something that can be transmitted with, uh, with numbers versus the soft information, I'll come back to that, which is more, you know, feeling about the ability of the CEO. What is my feeling about uh, the skill or the match of the, the CEO? So all this literature I quoted you until now, it's about public comment. Okay, and it's, it's a very large literature. I made a very biased selection of a few papers, but where do we stand? There's some evidence that uh, a turnover is good, it improves performance, but there's also some evidence that maybe we are firing the CEOs for bad luck. How can we differentiate about that? And one of the suggestions, and one in which I've been uh, moving, is can we learn something from different type of ownership. So all this literature on public companies, because of course for public companies we have much better information. We have much better financial numbers. We have the stock market. If we want to measure performance, much easier to look at the stock market. But can we look at somewhere else? So there one paper by Gao Harford and Lee, very recent, which compare public and private companies. So takes private company and public company in the same industry, matching them by various characteristics and compare them. And I have done uh, two papers, uh, one with uh, my ex-student, uh, Oguzan Karakash, and uh, the other one is the one that actually Eric was referring to, which is uh, with uh, Zbigniew Kominek and Alexander Ljungvist, in which we look at 
private companies in which there's private equity involved. And in a moment, I'll argue why. So public to private, you know, why, why private versus public? Because firm characteristics remain the same, but you have a different corporate governance, right? So it, it's a way to try to look at a different angle. Why did we look at private equity? Well, because private equity in the press can have two faces. You can see private equity is just about leverage, it's just about uh, exploiting the company, and in that case, is bad corporate governance. Not all private equity is good, but there are some. There are companies where the claim of private equity is we are a unique owner, we spend all the time there, we monitor better, we give better incentives, that's why we can turn around the company. Now, so the question is, if we can identify the cases of private equity where the corporate governance uh, is really monitoring very closely the manager, maybe we can learn something out of it. If, if, if we can identify better monitoring, what is the implication? And remember, private equity have a lot of uh, reputation as being very fast in hiring, in firing, sorry. Maybe also hiring a substitute, but definitely in firing. They don't have a big problem in firing people. So the question is, okay, so then we should see higher uh, turnover because as soon as they don't perform, they'll be fired and they will go in the direction again that turnover is good. That's one possibility. And also, talking about outside directors, in a way, the private equity partners that sit on the board are non-entrenched in the sense that they don't have to be nice to the CEOs. They often they are not, actually. Uh, but at the same time, are heavily involved in the, in the um, in the day-to-day -day activities of the firm. So they will have much more inside information than a non-exec that comes coming in, you know, one, once a month, will collect information, but it's still not the same type of information. So it could be a good way to distinguish, as I was saying before, between the monitoring hypothesis and the information hypothesis, because they are not entrenched, they have an incentive and ability to monitor, but they also don't have, have more information beyond their performance. So that's what we uh, want to look at. Let me give you first a slight anticipation of the results. Guy, Harvard, and Lee find that public firms have higher turnover of CEOs and higher sensitivity to performance. Maybe that means public for companies have better uh, corporate governance than uh, private companies. Then, however, they have a caveat that says, well, but Following a turnover, in a, a CEO turnover in a private company, the performance improves more. So that's already getting me a bit worried. So why does it improve more? But I could also argue, well, maybe it's because they do it less often. They do it when the CEO is so bad that then, of course, they, the performance improves a lot. But it's starting maybe worrying me a little. Then the paper I have with Oguzan Caracas, what we take, we take companies which are uh, taken, we look at comp UK companies that were public and were taken private through a leverage buyout with the private equity. And what we find is after the company is taken private, the CEO turnover decreases and is less sensitive to performance. So it's exactly the opposite, if you want, of the reputation of uh, private equity. Yes, they can fire more. And by the way, when they take over, yes, they can fire a lot of CEOs when there's the change of control and they take a company. But from there onwards, we observe lower turnover and lower sensitivity than when the company was public. So that is something that starts putting in question the usual conclusion we have, right? So we say, let's look at another angle and let's see if uh, maybe there's something to learn from others and uh, we can uh, revisit uh, a bit. So, I mean, maybe we can just go beyond the profits and, and look at other, other things. Or maybe they are just to say, well, you know, if the CEO comes and says, I really try hard. Yes, I'll keep you in place. I don't think private equity will really do that, but uh, let's uh, look a bit uh, beyond. 
say something uh, lentering slightly more in detail for what we did because I'm sure I have to convince you a bit more about my results. We looked at all UK leverage by our public to private from 98 to 2003 and we followed them until 2009. We stopped there because of the financial crisis that creates a, a big uh, change. So, so we, for, for the company, were not exited yet by 2009. It was almost like a different world, so we wanted uh, to stop. We reconstruct all the boards and we look at the turnover of the CEOs. And for each of these companies, we find the company of same size in the same industry that was not, they remain public, was public and remain public. So it's trying to look and uh, compare. What's our definition of CEO turnover? Well, we look at the period, it's to say certain number of uh, years before the company was taken public, and then we look afterwards, and we're saying from when it happened up to 2009, or when the private equity exited. And we look at how many times the CEO changed divided by the number of years. We do not distinguish between forced and voluntary because, uh, as I'm saying, it's very difficult to find uh, such information, although I'll come back to the other study in which we could uh, actually find it. So, before the, and as I'm saying, I, we are not looking at when the CEO is changed at the moment in which the private equity is entering, because that is a change of a CEO due to a change in control. I'm taking control. I didn't like that CEO. I want someone else. We are entering in asking the basic question, which is what does it mean that the board monitors the CEO? What does it mean to take a decision based on performance and so on? So we look at the board of the public company, how they monitor the CEO, or at least trying to infer that from looking at the turnover. And we look at the board when you have the company is backed by private equity, and look at what's the CEO turnover there and how sensitive to performance they are and compare uh, the two. Now, what happens? Here's the first number. So if you see the first line, it tells you the company that was taken uh, private by private equity backing, before, the turnover before, 14.5%, the turnover after, 9.2%. And this is statistically significant. So the turnover after the company is taken public is statistically significantly lower. If I look at matching companies, they were not, okay, 16.5 versus 14.5, but it was not statistically significant. So they're basically similar companies in terms of turnover. And the turnover afterwards, again, it's not statistically significantly different. So what I'm seeing is the matching company before and after in the same period do not see a lower turnover, but the private equity company see it. It's lower than, uh, than before and is lower than the matching companies, statistically significant. So that's the first uh, Cape Clan thing, right? I start by expecting the private equity can fire more. I'm actually finding them uh, firing less. So what is uh, going on? Do they really uh, private uh, monitor? Because, of course, the answer could be, well, but, we, but this, this story that the private equity look at the CEO, look at the board, work with them, it's all a story. All they do is huge leverage, take the money out. The last thing I want is to replace the CEO. If I have, a, you know, 90% leverage, I just want to leave things in place and uh, take money out. So maybe the, the, the turnover is lower because it's bad corporate governance. So that's not, uh, that's not a, an issue. So what we want to do is we want to identify the private equity deals where there was more focus on intervention, on being hands-on, and value creation, and see if in those one this, the turnover was higher or lower. Those are the one I, I'm uh, trying to look at. The way we go about it is really looking at the boards. So the basic idea is uh, the partner who's in charge in turning around the company, T -O one, two, zero, depending, is typically sitting on the board. You're not putting a, par a partner on the board if he or she has nothing to do because uh, there's nothing uh, that they are short in time, highly skilled people, so if you put them there, more involved because you need them. 
So we try to look at their involvement by looking at what percentage of the board is made by private equity people versus uh, the CEO, the CFO, assuming they are not the private equity, the, the marketing manager, or an outsider, and other things. So we want to model that. So what we do for, and for the academic in the, the room, we try to do a two stages less squares in which first we model the involvement and then we look at the effect of the involvement on the CEO turnover. So what do we find? We find that private equity partners seem to be even more involved when there is a need, which was our assumption. They are, the, the, there's more of them on the board when the CEO was changed during transition, let's say when the company came in and replaced the CEO, which is exactly <laughs> consistent with the idea when, when you change the CEO, it means the CEO before, but maybe there was, there's no more to restructure. The company was not working well, that's why I replaced that CEO. Even if the CEO was doing very well, uh, the fact that that CEO left, I don't have the top place who was in controlling place, so it also is not a good situation. And as I was saying before, I probably know the financial engineering deals. If you're entering just to put leverage and take money out, you're not changing the CEO in such a situation. So one way we see it is we try to look at cases where there's more need of intervention or support. And then we look at the various uh, measures for the corporate governance literature uh, about uh, capturing more complex businesses. For example, uh, they use a fraction of outside directors when the company was public. Uh, there's a large literature capture in that way, the, the business is more complex. And the, again, we find the more complex is the business, uh, the more you have uh, in the board uh, private equity people. And if leverage is low again, you have more in the board. Given that, I will not inflict on you many slides, just want to say, what do we find very quickly? We find that when you change CEO and when, and when the business is more complex, so exactly the two measures we were saying, one and two, and also the three, the leverage, but it's not very statistically significant, the, there's more people involved. So the first step is it does look like private equity is more involved when there's more focus on value creation, there's more things to fix when there's more need for them. And given that, what happens? Then we look at the effect of their involvement on the CEO turnover. What do we find? Independently from involvement, more difficult deals will have more turnover. Not surprisingly, if it's more difficult, the CEO is more likely to fail. So that is consistent. But interestingly, the more you have private equity involved in the board, the lower is the turnover. Which goes back, as I was saying, it's not, it's, if you were concerned, oh, they, the turnover is lower, but that's because all they're thinking is taking the money out. No, the turnover is lower in the cases in which private equity was more involved, more present on the board, and that I had just used my first stage model to prove that they are on the board when there's more need of them. So again, that creates a problem. The more they're involved, the more they're invo uh, monitoring or supporting, the lower the turnover. So, the view that we traditionally had by corporate governance with public company, and it has been recently questioned by this other paper, wondering whether it was bad luck, was say good turnover, good news. But then when I look at here and I try to measure the involvement and it leads to lower turnover, I start asking myself, well, then maybe the turnover is not so good. Maybe it's exactly a reaction to uh, bad luck and they're more uh, involved. So in a way, I, uh, I arrived to this paper after having done the other and I started thinking more and more, 
this paper was not, did not start to looking at that, but when we started doing these results, it made me come back to the other paper on DBRD, and I'll show you in a moment. Because when we were presenting that paper, and I'll describe it in a moment, we looked at private firms, again, at companies. This was transition countries. That's why we had the European Bank of Restri uh, the BRD uh, um, so involved, in which private equity had invested. And we found, and I'll show you in a moment, that they was clearly not reacting to bad luck. They were doing right. And when we were presenting, a lot of people said, but how come your results are not consistent with the ones of Gentry and Khan that say, well, the CEOs are fired for bad luck. How do you reconciliate? And already at my time, I said, well, maybe it's because there's private equity and it is uh, uh, paying uh, more attention. So in a way, when I arrived to this paper, I was saying, well, that is maybe, I'm looking at the public company becoming private with the shareholder involved and observing, and I, and I observe exactly that, the fact that there's less turnover. And I'll come back also to the sensitivity, but for the moment, let me focus on moment of turnover. So it kind of, the idea is the more we monitor, maybe we make less mistakes and we don't fire CEOs for bad luck. And therefore, maybe as a public company, board of public company, we need to learn a bit more from there. I see I'm going, uh, I know, I'm on time, sorry. So let me show you. Uh, let me say, so let me go back, take one moment step and go back to that other paper and show you a little bit what we saw, what we showed uh, there. As Eric was mentioning, uh, at least something came out of this reading, this quarterly report for years for thousands of companies. Uh, what we had was the BRD was sending someone from the BRD talking to each company, to CEO, to the board, to the private equity people sitting on the board, and then writing a report about what's going on, and reporting exactly all the beliefs of the manager. So what we did, we read this quarterly report, and we coded them. Okay? So when we were looking, what we were, uh, and we were looking at the CEO uh, turnover, and in this case, because we knew exactly what was happening from the board a minute, we knew if it was f firing or it was voluntary. So in this case, they are def what we are looking at definitely firing of the CEOs. And in that case, what did the board have? And it goes back to also the issue about sensitivity to performance. They had all the information about the financial performance, and then they had what we uh, academics call soft information, which is like opinions, not necessarily back, backed by uh, poor performance. In some cases, uh, I do remember reading some report, they would say, well, the company is really taking off. We just don't think the CEO can cope with the next stage. We don't think the CEO, you know, it was great for this phase, is not the best for CEO for, another, for the next phase. So the firing of a CEO can even follow very good performance, but the point is how can you back up, that's what we call about soft information, the idea that the CEO is not good for the next phase, right? In other words, it's not also about absolute skills, it's about the match between the CEO and the status a company is in, it's something that you can't exactly back up with hard data. It has to be, you know, I looked and that is my opinion. I can give you examples of behavior, but it's something hard to transfer and to prove with hard data. So what is the things we collected? We were looking at proxy in which uh, exactly, you know, in the, in the report, they were saying the opinion of the board or especially of the private equity representative about is this CEO competent or independently from competence is a good match for this company. Or in case of poor performance, they were exactly saying, well, did they take a specific decision that was the wrong decision or instead were it due to bad, bad luck. So there they are specifically saying there is bad luck. Let me give you some example. Example of incompetence, they would say, this is taken really not from the report. The top management team is strong, clear statement. The next one is, well, the CEO lacks sufficient skill in some areas. We are going to complement the CEO. Notice the CEO is not fired yet, right? We are just 
say, well, the CEO is not so good in this area. Let's see if by providing some more support, it's enough and the CEO will shine, or really is a fundamental lack. So you can see, you observe, you intervene, but in the meantime, you're also updating your beliefs about the, 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 how good the CEO is. Or you do specific case, well, the fund manager sees the need for a more efficient sales and marketing strategy and the CEO is being replaced. So it's also very precise about where is the problem about the CEO. Other cases, management action and decisions. How the management, I have to say, reading all this report, I felt sometimes so sorry about these managers. <laughs> Because also, this was transition country from 92, and recently everything was happening. Everything was going wrong. So I was thinking, I am so glad I chose to be an academic. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, uh, they have a good, uh, good pay, as uh, that's a uh, thing. So, so life is tough. But so th this was a case in which the management made the serious mistakes and signed a fixed option to hedge against the strengthening, and then the currency instead went the opposite direction. Notice one of the reasons we had chosen this statement to, uh, to highlight is, is it a mistake? Is a mistake exposed? But ex ante, they probably didn't expect to weakening. So it's also pointing out, yes, it's a mistake, but maybe I would have made the same. So it's really judging what is happening. And because if you were there when they chose the decision, you probably would have thought, well, I agreed with them that it was something good uh, to take. Or bad luck, this is a case of a fire, although I have to, I remember later that my favorite one was one about an ice cream company in Poland, uh, which had an abysmal uh, uh, quarter, and uh, they were saying, but this was the, the worst summer ever, incredibly cold in Poland. Nobody would have sold any ice creams. And again, probably all the, all the peers uh, were not selling ice creams uh, uh, either. So you can see that the reports are very detailed, and, and this is uh, what uh, one is trying to look. Now, what do we, uh, you don't need uh, to read uh, all, the, all the things in detail, it's very small, but uh, we, the first thing we looked is, we look at this report and we try to say what affects the, fa the decision that uh, the, the board the opinion that the CEO is not competent, okay? So when we see finally the, the board saying this CEO is not really competent, they haven't fired him yet, or her. I have to say, I have to say him, there was not a single woman in, uh, as a CEO in this, uh, in this data set. So I could say him or her, but unfortunately, it was all him. Um, so, so they haven't fired the CEO yet, but they might at a certain point arrive to having doubts. What brings that? Well, the first uh, number, which is negative and significant, the first thing is if the performance in the past is not being good, that will affect. It's not like we disregard performance. So that will affect the opinion that maybe the CEO is uh, not that good. And then it's, uh, however, if you go down, you see that the other thing that is instead negative and significant is the bad luck. So in other words, in this case, because they were commenting exactly on bad luck or not, the opinion of whether the CEO was competent or not relied on the past performance but made amend if the board thought that the, the bad performance was completely due to bad luck. So there was a clear undoing of the luck component in determining the skill. Now, and then, however, there is a four times more likely, it's a clear remaining of the, of the incompetent. So basically it builds over time. If, they thought at a certain point in the previous period that the manager was incompetent. Well, there could be a change of fortune and change idea, but there was clearly persistence. So there's a clearly building up about the opinion, about the quality of the match of the CEO with the company. So not only skills, but the quality of the match that brings the board, 
uh, remember, I, I say the board, but here the strong opinion was the private equity manager that was sitting on the board. Uh, that was really determining. Now, the second stage was, okay, we saw what makes them think that, is, uh, that it is uh, incompetent or not. What determines that the CEO is uh, uh, going to be fired? And the first thing we saw is performance. So we are happy to know that the turnover of CEO was sensitive to performance. So to tell you, if the performance worsened, so by uh, one uh, statistic, uh, one percent statistic, st uh, st statistical deviation, I'm, I'm having a problem Spons with that. <laughs> yes, thank you. I don't know why. I c um, the probability that the CEO would have been uh, fired was 122%. In other words, strong reaction to bad performance in the past. They are not crazy. Notice that past decisions and past bad luck didn't enter anymore. What really mattered was is the manager viewed as incompetent or not. In other words, when you arrive at the final decision whether to replace or not the CEO, all those things, did they take the right decision, Were they, was it luck, was it not, it's all subsumed in that opinion about the CEO. Is he competent, not competent, is it a good match or not, in that soft information of the opinion. Performance still matter, but if you notice, the performance is a much smaller effect than the opinion of the CEO. In other words, yes, it helps if it keeps also underperforming, but it's this building up about the opinion of the CEO, and that is the larger determinant. We, we did a lot of stuff in that paper, but let me tell you what we were taking out of this. The, inf the, the, the sense of what we're having, and that's what made me think more and more about these things about uh, the boards, is that boards in this way act actively monitor the managers, a board like a, 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 how a board should be, right? Not, el el not every board maybe, but how they. They actively board, uh, monitor manager, and they should collect both hard and soft information. In other words, they should collect the performance, they should pay attention to the performance, but beyond that, there's a lot of information about the CEO ability, how the CEO reacts to the bad luck, how the CEO is able to take advantage of the good luck, how, you know, uh, how it interacts with the company, and all these things are extremely uh, important. Uh, before I go on on this, I say, so this is, but of course it depends, right? It's saying the board is very disappointed in your performance CEO, the employee aren't even sending you hate mail anymore. So of course, uh, what is making you a good match or not is very dependent on the board, but on the board point of view, this is a more questionable board, but uh, but the idea is you collect information from a lot of uh, various things. And then when they are fired is because enough evidence of your ability or your uh, suitability to that company is accumulated. And because the company underperformed both of them, but the first one is the one that's important. They are not fired because of poor performance that is beyond their control, not because of it. In these boards we were looking with private equity backing, not because the industry was underperforming, not because the market was underperforming, not even for taking decisions like the FX I was saying that turn out to be wrong exposed. If it's not a case of be, you know, a decision that you could have seen at the time that was not uh, the, the right in, a decision. So, that also made me think more about what's the role of a board. To a certain extent, if all we do is react to the financial numbers, then do we really need a board? Let's just look at the numbers and let's find an algorithm with a computer that reacts, or let's present it to the shareholder. If it's all about hard information, why do we pay 
uh, these board members, including me, so I put myself uh, in the group uh, a lot for uh, just reacting to numbers. Of course we want the soft information. That's why we put them there, to observe, to be involved, and to do something that you can't go in front of the shareholder and just say, well, uh, it's, this is exactly what happened and this is what happened. Eventually, you ask the board to say, trust us, we have monitored, we have looked, and beyond the performance, beyond the, the luck, good luck, or the term uh, numbers, this is not the right CEO, and that's the one we change. And you can see that, therefore, it's also leading to sensitivity to performance, and that's what I was mentioning before. Because if it's not only about observing performance, then you could have excessive sensitivity to performance. That shouldn't be necessarily the only thing or the most important uh, things. That is what is the role of a board. So let me now go back to my original paper in which I was, uh, by the way, to the other paper, the one in which I was looking at UK company from public to private. I showed you that uh, the, um, that the CEO turnover decreases, and it decreases more when uh, uh, they are more involved. But as I said already at the beginning, a lot of people argue, well, CEO turnover per se doesn't mean that much. Corporate governance literature has focused a lot on sensitivity to performance. But right now, using this other data, I was arguing really, but is even sensitivity to performance, is that the right measure? So what do we find? Again, we find that after the company is taken private in a leverage buyout, also the sensitivity to performance decreases. And again, the decrease is stronger, the more is the involvement of the private equity. So uh, here, of, of course, the, the, what we do is slightly more difficult. We can't do exactly what a lot of the literature does, exactly because a lot of the literature uses uh, public companies, and therefore they'll use performance, the stock, stock price performance. Obviously, given that we are looking at private company, we can't use the stock price performance. And we look at operating performance, which is a noisy measure, especially in private companies, because you don't have such detailed data. So that's what makes our work more difficult. But we still find that the sensitivity is lower afterwards, is lower than matching companies which have the same, uh, same industry, same size, but remain public. And it's dec this decrease is stronger the more uh, the private equity is involved. So again, it goes in the direction that the more a board can be involved and follow the daily to day uh, activities, the less maybe you should rely on uh, the financial numbers. Of course they matter, but you sh it should only matter to a certain extent, and you should be able to distinguish. See, it goes also in the direction that maybe there is some bad luck. Maybe as a public board, we should learn more to distinguish what is luck, good or bad, and what is instead the, 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 the ability, the skill of uh, the CEO. So let me, uh, let me uh, conclude. I think I... Uh, Time, yes. Uh, are the CEOs fired for bad luck? Well, I, from looking at other papers and looking at my papers, I feel that, uh, yes, sometimes, I mean, you, you would think it's easy, right, to, to distinguish. You say, I compare to the peers, I compare to the, uh, the stock market, but it's not that simple because you might think, that, things are going badly, where is the CEO uh, reacting? Uh, you may wonder, the CEO doing stronger. It's actually more difficult than one would think to disentangle the lack component from the skill component. Mm -hmm. But it might be that we are taking the lack, or anyway, we are overweighting the performance, which ends by taking too much into account also the lack uh, component. And also, I feel the role of the board should be more and more to rely more on the soft information and less on just the financial number. Of course, I'm not advocating firing the CEOs because we feel like it, 
although occasionally I do feel like it, but uh, not, uh, you know, but you, you, the soft information has to be built uh, on the basis of uh, what happens. Now, um, and also advocating more and more involvement on the CEO decisions when they are taken. It's not only looking at the results, it's be involved and discuss with the CEO when the decisions are taken. This is the only way to actually evaluate uh, uh, the CEO. If you look at the results as post, again, it's very difficult uh, uh, to disentangle. And uh, as I'm saying, you know, in a way the results, uh, although it goes against myself too and is not uh, great, support a bit also the fact that these results, uh, the, non the independent, the outside directors uh, are very good because they increase the sensitivity of uh, turnover to performance can be questioned on to what extent they are just to have less inside information and therefore are overreacting to the performance. And I have finished if anybody has questions. Thank you. Well, I, 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 David Devlin, I had a different question which was a little bit like Mike's question, which if you play with the title a little bit, it prompts your talk of your title and the way you did the analysis prompts in my mind the question, are CEOs rewarded for good luck? I mean, fine, they might be fired when for inadequate performance that nevertheless looks good, but I know there's a lot of literature on you know, remuneration, yes. but to what extent has anybody examined the luck component? That's the question really. So there is a literature, right, that shows an asymmetry, and they show that, indeed, they seem to be rewarded for good luck, but not punished in terms of compensation for bad luck. One-way street. One way street. But then you could say if, if they are, however, fired for bad luck, maybe that compensates a little bit that asymmetry, right? Maybe you don't do it with the, with the compensation, but you fire. So to a certain extent, maybe that kind of makes it, the, the, the picture slightly more uh, symmetric. You're Thank you. So it could, could be argued... Your name, please. Sorry, Mark Lepere. Um, it could be argued, I guess, but tell me if it could be, <laughs> that um, one of the drivers behind your findings is that, it, I mean, is this direct relationship between private equity and management control, effectively, if you like, there's more skin in the game. It, would that therefore argue that perhaps on, in terms of public equity, that um, non-executive directors should perhaps be paid by the shareholders rather than the companies? In other words, trying to give them a more direct management stake in, in the whole game. Well, that's quite difficult, right, because in a way, you're right. I can't say public boards should behave like a uh, private equity board. It's different. You know, there's, there's just no way. There's also, uh, in the case of private equity, even if you had an independent there, you're just responding to one shareholder. And in a public company, you have multiple interests. It's, it, it's, it's hard to say. So to a certain extent, I wasn't uh, uh, trying to, but, but I was trying to say, well, maybe we have something to learn, and maybe how we judge a board and how we, what, what we think is a good board or not, we should revise. So I wasn't trying so much to transform a public company to look like a private equity company, but more just uh, say, can we ask them to do it less? Whether we can do it by giving them, you're saying, more skin in the game. It's also hard, right? Because, uh, it, I mean, private equity puts a lot of money to have skin in the game. So if you give them a little bit of shares, does that, is that enough to make skin on the game in a large public company? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. So I, 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 it's not I haven't thought enough, but it's an interesting question, how we get a board to not overreact to performance and so on. At this stage, I was more saying, well, we need to convince people that actually these are not the right criteria by which to even judge a board. And it could be that if the shareholders are more convinced with that, the board will feel more comfortable that they don't have to react to performance necessarily, right? Sometimes the pressure can just come from the shareholders uh, and the board can feel more comfortable if they know that the shareholder understand this. Paul Coombs. Um, are you looking at uh, 
future research on the comparative outcomes for football team managers? <laughs> um, I don't follow, I, I used to follow more football, I don't follow it that much. Uh, oh yeah, because they are very sensitive to performance, uh, that's true. Well, it probably is an re, uh, overreaction, uh, but I don't, I don't know, I have seen that we have research that shows that the stock market reacts to how the team is performing in the World Cup. So I guess if the stock market is uh, so irrational to, rea to react to the World Cup performance, uh, it's hard uh, not to make them uh, even fire the CEO. But I will think about it. Maybe that's a good... Uh... If you could say your name, please. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm Donald Nordberg. Uh, thanks very much. I, I found this fascinating. Thank and you. One of the things that I haven't seen commented upon in the literature very much at all private equity literature, is the, is the notion that you seem to be suggesting under the, under the covers here, that the work of directors of private equity companies involve a blurring of the distinction between the service role of directors and the monitoring role. That these, these two roles are not quite as distinct as we, as we like to force them to be in academic speak to measure different kinds of things. And that that blurring of the role then suggests that the role of the director has to change, perhaps if this model it would be translated into the public setting, with a, with a much greater involvement of the directors in the business, therefore fewer non-executive positions, less distance, less independence, which goes against the orthodoxy of the mainstream corporate governance literature. Now, judging from your comments, I think you want to go against the mainstream of the corporate governance literature, but I wonder if you have any thoughts about that and that distinction of, of monitoring and service roles. Yes, no, it, it's actually something that we thought about it a lot and we, saw, we tried to see if we could put it in it here. I would have liked to see it as one place more than the others. Unfortunately, the nature of the data did just not allow us to distinguish between the two. So, so, that, so I, I completely agree, that is another important question. It's not only the monitoring, so you could have the other side and how it interacts. Um, we couldn't exactly distinguish. But there are things here that I thought could go in that direction. For example, as I was mentioning, I was having, you know, I, I just gave you only a few, few examples, but in the one in the transition, it was very interesting because some of the things that were considered like we, we called them as honest mistakes uh, were exactly the fact that they were saying the, the fund manager, so the private equity person, was involved with them when they took a certain decision, advised them, and they kind of made the same mistake. Even if they were not completely in line, they, they, they kind of went along. The, 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 the support was there in, in going in the same direction, and therefore they couldn't expose to say, well, the CEO was incompetent because that meant they also were incompetent. So in a way, you're right, the blurring comes from the fact that the more you support them and you advise them, the more you're also able to evaluate them. And it's, uh, and it's an interesting uh, view, right? It's, it's two roles, but they're not, they're very complementary. They're not a substitute. But in the data, it's very difficult to disentangle. You can have suggestions and so on, but at least in our data, we, we, we couldn't uh, do it. Mark Feider. Mark Feider, Alan and Overy. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, I skipped the, um, the first part of your uh, presentation, and apologies for that, but um, in terms of the methodology, what, what is firing? Uh, let me just explain what I, what I mean. You know, is it just an early termination for whatever cause? Or, for instance, does it also include the non-renewal of a term contract? Or, for instance, would it include the departure for health reasons, whether real or just invoked, or any other reason? So, you know, just I'm struggling with the term of firing. I mean, of course, you know, you can, can attribute some, uh, um, you know, some, some, some more um, direct uh, meaning to the term, but maybe, you know, it also has a more larger term, and then, you know, would the results of your findings possibly be flawed by just enlarging the scope of what you include in the parameter of, of firing? 
Yes, so of course, uh, you know, the distinguish between what is a voluntary turnover, what is really forced turnover, what is really firing or not, is a big uh, question in the literature. Now, depending on which paper writes so data set and so on, I have a different answer. So the ones I was mentioning is DBRD, because we have the detailed data, we know exactly when it's fired. Already the ones that we have from public to private, the ones with the private equity, we don't. But for example, if it's after when it's private equity involved, I doubt is really voluntary because the typical uh, things this, uh, the CEOs have, there's some evidence in contra of private equity, is that the incentives are very large, but they're collected at the end. You don't vest that much. If you leave early, even the things vested, you lose them all. So it's very, it's very costly to leave. So I would imagine, even if it's voluntary, there's something not working. It is borderline. So in, in, my, in, in, in the other ones, which are public companies, uh, these days there are some algorithms, so people become very sophisticated, although they have, they have ultimately to um, recognize that they can't look at it completely, but they uh, have this algorithm that rely on anything covered on the news, on the uh, use of certain words in the, in the news and things like that to try to distinguish between forced and voluntary. So that's also something that is you, usually done. We don't exactly because it's private equity plus the company are private so you have less uh, in the news. But another approach I was mentioning at the beginning, there's a paper by Gentro and Llewellyn and what they do is they say, well, you know what, we, we're just gonna drop the distinguish between, uh, distinction between forced and voluntary and just going to focus on uh, performance induced. Because to a certain extent, uh, if it's performance induced, uh, whether it's voluntary or it's uh, forced, uh, there's clearly evidence that it doesn't work. But at the same time, because I'm trying to do look and say maybe it should be less performance induced, uh, I don't want to to drop it. But I mean, obviously that is a big, uh, a big issue. Uh, in, in mind, because of private equity, I think is a bit less, but when one looks for the public part, uh, it, it is an issue. The literature has become, academic literature has become quite sophisticated with this algorithm, but you can never get it exactly right. I mean, I also now handling some stuff on turnover of partners in the private equity people. And I have exactly the reason reported to all the investors and so on, and they're all leaving because uh, they're pursuing private interest all the time. Sometimes I can use the age, but even the age, uh, you know, to, uh, close to retirement, some people retire early, some people retire later, is, uh, is not such a good. Uh... Last question. I'm Hagen Schweinitz. Many thanks for your very interesting presentation. I'm a practitioner, um, and I'm, I'm very intrigued by the findings that you present on the last slide. There's one thing that um, I kept on thinking about. You talk about the question about the quality and suitability of the CEO, and you look at it, if, if I understood correctly, more as an ex post from an exposed way, and you, it seems to me that you seem to accept the fact that there's a learning process about his or her qualities. Now, I would like to make the point, shouldn't, for, for, for real life, shouldn't we all spend more time or more effort beforehand, before appointing a CEO, finding about his or her qualities and fit with the company's culture? Well, of course. <laughs> um, yes, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with you, but what I learned by looking here, right, like let's take the public to private. Big leverage buyout with very well-known, uh, successful private equity companies, change the CEO, hire a new one, and then they change that CEO. So I would have imagined, you know, they, they promised them a huge compensation. So I don't know, right? But what, from looking at this data, what stares to me is it's 
clearly difficult to choose the right CEO. So you, 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 maybe we should, we should spend more time, that is possible, but it looks like until you see that CEO in that new fit, in that new company, in that culture, and in a certain situation, it's very difficult to extrapolate. I think it's, it's just very difficult to, to judge. It's a difficult role, and uh, unless you see them uh, doing it, uh, it's hard. So that's one of the things that I felt by learning by looking at private equity. It, it's actually very difficult to judge people exactly, it seems to me. Okay, thank you very much, Francesca. Thank you. I think uh, people are fascinated by the title and what you said, and we could go on for another hour, uh, but time is limited. Uh, thank you very much for giving this ECGI annual lecture. Thank you to the LSE for hosting it. I think it's been uh, fascinating, somebody said, um, and to be continued. And it's all on the record, uh, and I think you will get many clicks, uh, people watching. Um, thank you. <laughs>